controls for nonlinear hyperbolic uh, systems. The title might suggest that it's related to model predictive control, but it's actually quite different. So the, the control inputs are computed in a direct fashion and not via optimization or so. Um, so this, this work is in collaboration with, with Voldemort Normo at NTNU in Norway and also Michael Catoni here in Melbourne. Um, so in one sentence, we, we are looking at systems where there's a tracking problems where there's a nonlinear hyperbolic partial differential equation between the actuator and the um, tracking objective. Um, so mathematically, we, we have a state W here, which evolves on a finite spatial domain, which is uniform here, so x and 0, 1, and time t. Um, the state W consists of two states, u and v, and it was according to this PDE, so the subscripts here mean partial derivatives, so the partial derivative of W with respect to time is some matrix lambda times the x derivative plus some nonlinear function f. Uh, lambda here has this diagonal structure with a negative and a positive entry, uh, which we'll later see can be associated with speeds. And both lambda and f depend nonlinearly on the location x and on the state. Um, this boundary condition for u at x equals zero, so it's a nonlinear function of v at x equals zero and also varying in time, so this can include time varying disturbances. Uh, the boundary condition for v at x equals one is the control input u and the initial condition. And the objective is that v follows a reference signal at the uncontrolled boundary at x equals zero. Um, so the tracking objective is usually written implicitly as a nonlinear function of u and v and time, um, but but usually um, this can be um, solved for uh, v of zero. So, so we assume that we can write it in this form. Um, so there are different case, cases, different types of uh, hyperbolic PDEs. So the system is called quasi-linear when um, this function this function lambda depends on the state, and f is a nonlinear function of the state. Um, it is called semilinear if lambda is independent of the state, can still depend on x, and but but f is still a nonlinear function of w, and it's linear if lambda is independent of w, and f is a linear function of w. So, so quasi-linear sounds a bit like it's similar to linear, but it's more or less the, the, the most nonlinear case that one can get in practice. Um, okay, so this is what we're looking at mathematically. Uh, the practical motivation, the, the couple of figures here, I will go to, into the details in the next slides. Um, but we're looking at a, for instance, an open water channel where we use an inflow to control the water level at the downstream end. Um, and the dynamics in this channel here are controlled by PD of this form, um, an offshore drilling rig where we have an actuator on the top and want to control the pressure at the bottom of the well in several kilometers depth. Or for instance, here this from another paper not from my work, um, we want to lower a mining elevator into a mine via two cables and try to maximize the speed while minimizing the, the, the cage roll. Um, just by applying a force at the top. Um, so in case of this open water channel, there are very simple PI controllers that work very well in like 99% of the cases. Um, similar here in this offshore uh, drilling uh, example, there are PI controllers that, that achieve very good pressure tracking in practice that works most of the time well and probably very similar here. Um, but we are interested in those 1% of cases or whatever the percentage is, um, where those PDE dynamics are very relevant, be it because the, the time scale of disturbance is in the same range as the delay in the system, or be it just because the, the system is pushed to the absolute limits of, of what it can provide performance, so that one really has to, to consider those. 
um, PDE dynamics. Okay, so to go more into detail, um, this offshore drilling example is here a rig which is floating on the waves and therefore it's moving up and down with the wave. So to see it's just a heat motion. Um, so typical heat motion off the coast of Norway. Um, there's a trail string here, which is the basically the tool that um, trails at the bottom. Um, in such a, such a well, they, they are, let's say, five kilometer deep. And they are filled with fluid. And it's really important to, to control the pressure here at the bottom. But the only actuators that are available are a pump and a choking valve that are located here on the top, several kilometers away. Um, most of the time, as I said, one can control this with a, uh, the, the pressure down here with a simple PI controller. It works very well, but so, the, so, so, so they absolutely want to minimize the, the time where, um, the non-productive time where one is not able to drill. And they're also are pushing the limits of, um, so, so they call these high air pressure, high temperature wells, where the pressure margins here down here are really narrow. And so there are some cases where this heave motion, when this drill string here, um, so which is more or less a solid pipe, um, goes up and down, causes pressure oscillation, and, and those pressure oscillations can violate the, the safety margins of the pressure uh, down here. And this can have really severe effects. Every 10 years or so, there's something big in the news that some oil well exploded because of something like that, not, not due, due to heat usually, but, but there can be very catastrophic uh, outcomes. Um, so it's really important to, to control the pressure down here. And in, in case of this, this when, when those heat induced pressure oscillations are enough to violate the pressure margins, it, it's not enough to, to do a simple PI control design because if the pressure down here gets too low, then, then it, there's a delay of five seconds or so until we, one can um, notice this pressure deviation at the top. And then until one reacts, sends a pressure wave down here, um, then 10 seconds or so are passed, which is just the, the, the period of the, of the wave motion here. So, so the, the the actuation will be completely out of phase with the disturbance. So instead one actually has to sense the, the heat motion up here, predict what it will be in five seconds or so, and then preemptively have to send a pressure wave down here, which if one gets it right, cancels the, the effect of the heat motion. Um, the pressure dynamics, in this fluid column here, they, they are described by, modeled by this kind of equation. So for the pressure and flow rate along the well, um, the heat motion in this via this disturbance term Vd, which is the velocity of the trail string, which enters as a flow disturbance here, but also in the friction term here, where the fluid sticks to the trail string. Um, and then the control input U enters up here via a yeah, basically it's the opening of a valve. Um, so this set of equation is pretty much a prototype of a semilinear hyperbolic PDE. The speeds, which are determined by these coefficients here, the beta, A, and rho, are almost perfectly independent of the state. But this friction term F here is highly nonlinear. So this figure here shows that the rheology of typical fluids, which basically determines the friction term. And every time this trail string changes the changes direction from upwards to downwards, or one jumps over a discontinuity here. So, so in reality, it's probably not discontinuity, it's, but it's an extremely fast change. And there's no way to accurately linearize this around zero, which would be needed to, to get a linear model. Um, Okay, uh, the, the, the next example are those steep water channels. Um, and with, with steep, I mean that it's so steep that the upstream end of the channel is significantly like a couple of meters higher than, than the water level at the downstream end. And this leads to a water level profile like here. So a very shallow um, water profile in the, in the upstream part. And then, um, 
the, the um, a deep part that is only relatively short in the downstream end. Um, and again, so, so if this channel was nearly horizontal, they are very successful PI controls that has been applied on a large scale in practice. Um, when it gets a bit too low water level, adjusts the inflow and then uh, fills it up. Um, but this is, it, it will come to a point where, where it doesn't work in, in very steep and long um, channels because so, so those PI controls they, they are designed on the assumption that the dynamics in here can be uh, modeled as in simple integrated delay model. So integrated part says with what flows in then water level will rise by inflow divided by surface area. And the delay is usually relatively short and um, independent of the state. Um, it's very different in those steep channels. And again, it depends on the slope, it depends on the length and so on. Um, it's probably first, not intuitive first, but, but the speeds at which the water waves travel down, the speed is much slower in this very shallow part uh, than it is in the deep part. So the delay will be longer. And it will also depend on the state. So depending on what the flow rate and water level are in this part. Um, and then the other problem is that the storage is much less than if this channel was horizontal and the, the water profile would more or less look like a rectangle. Um, so we can't rely on as much storage and tolerate as much water, level, uh, water volume changes as in a more horizontal channel. Um, so the equations here are the saint Benoit equations, um, which are more or less a prototype of a quasi-linear hyperbolic PDE. Um, so as I said, the delay depends very much on the state, on the flow rate and water level in this upstream part. And there's also a non-linearity due to the, um, so, so when we increase the, so due to changes in the, in the water level profile, when we change the inflow here, the water will not just flow down. It will first have to build up um, sufficient profile to actually provide this flow. So if you increase the inflow, the water level will increase until we reach the equilibrium where gravity cancels friction. Okay, um, so as I said, the, the, this mining cake elevator uh, example is not my work, I took it from this paper by Juan P. and Kirstich. But it's a very similar scenario. We have a wave type PDE for the um, movement of this or tension of these cables. In this case, there are two cables, so there are two of the uh, same type of PDEs. They also couple to an ODE modeling the, the motion of this cage at the bottom and the boundary condition again at the top. Um, given in, in, in terms of the force in this case. Um, and th they argue that they also want to go to the limits of what, uh, what like the system can perform be because they want to save time. And if they can save one minute, every time they lower a crew down into the mine, then uh, this will increase inf um, productivity by that much. And so therefore they, really want to go through the PDEs to, to go to the limit of the, the achievable performance. Um, other examples what people have looked at are, for instance, um, high voltage direct current power cables and even traffic flow models. So, so there are a couple of examples. Although I haven't really seen where the, these type of controls have really been applied in practice. And I should also say that, um, so the controller in, in, in this paper is, derived with a different but related method, which is the backstepping stepping method. And in this case, they can apply because there's no non-linearity. So this is a linear model um, with state independent and linear coefficients here. Okay, um, so to put it a bit more into context, there are two approaches in the literature that are relevant to this talk. Um, the first is this open loop controllability approach. So um, they, they actually do provide a controller, but, but the focus is usually on showing controllability. So they do show that a system can be brought to a desired state in finite time. Um, but, but 
they do this by actually actually constructing it key control inputs that drive the system there. So, so it is a constructive method, uh, but it is an open loop controller. So they are, the control inputs are pre-computed once for a very long time interval, and then the system is just run in open loops. So, so this will is fine from a mathematical point of view, but will in practice be sensitive to, to uncertainty and prediction errors and so on. Um, so, so this approach has probably been started by Serena in 1969 and then extended to, to many other similar systems by Lee and Rao and Gogat and Leugering, they, they have been the first to look at uh, tracking problems similar to what we look at here in this talk. Um, and then there's this, this backstabbing approach. So this is actually a, a, a way to, to actually construct feedback controllers so where the control inputs are continuously updated based on uh, new measurements. Um, but it is limited to linear systems, whereas controllability uh, results they, they apply to the, to the quasi -linear, full quasi-linear uh, non-linear systems. Um, this, this approach goes back to Kirstich, and then one of the students, Michel Yayev, did it mainly for parabolic PDEs, and then Vasquez and Bimeklio and, and others extended it to, to hyperbolic PDEs, like the ones you can see here. Um, so the method I pr present in the next couple of slides is kind of a mixture between the two because it uh, exploits predictions somewhat similar to the controllability approach. And actually, the, the first step of the control input design is exactly the same as in the proof of controllability. Exactly the same as the first step in the proof of controllability. Um, but, but it's also a feedback control method where the, the uh, control inputs are frequently updated based on new measurements, uh, like it's done in backstabbing. And it's actually also it turned out that the method is a link between these two approaches because, so, so for instance, if we take a really long um, sampling period and then do a bit of tuning, then we, we can get exactly the same control inputs that one would get from this approach. But for linear systems, and again, with a bit of tuning, one would get exactly the same control inputs as the backstepping controls. So, so in special cases, the method I will be talking about generalizes either to this method or to this method. Okay, um, so in this slide, this will probably present the whole idea of the method. So this figure here shows the characteristic lines of those kinds of systems. So the time axis here and the spatial domain in this direction. Control input U enters here at x equals one uh, for this boundary condition here. And then it propagates with some finite speed, lambda v, uh, which is given here, through the domain. And it propagates through the domain. Uh, in this line, it starts. The initial condition goes through the domain till it reaches the boundary at x equals zero. Then there it is reflected by this nonlinearity here. So one gets sort of the initial condition, or the boundary condition for u here, and then propagates upwards again with, with the speed lambda u in the opposite direction. That's why the minus is here. So n goes through and then up again. Um, due to this finite speed, the control input doesn't immediately affect, affect the state um, in the interior of the domain. So it, it takes a while to, to get into the interior the, for the effect of the input to propagate into the interior of the domain, but the state at the current time uh, step is completely independent, still completely independent of the control input. So there's no way to control it. Um, and therefore, the idea will be to only control what we can control, which is basically the state on this line along which the control input propagates. Um, so it will be summarized here. Move this. Um, so we, our tracking objective is, is located here at the, at the uncontrolled boundary. Um, we know with the control input at this time, we cannot do anything about the boundary value up to that time. We can only basically affect it here. Um, and then we also know 
if you put in a control input here and it propagates through the domain, then it like this this state of v will, will change due to this nonlinear term here. So what we put in here will not be what we arrive, what will arrive here. Um, but we do know what the track um, so assuming we can predict the disturbances and know what the tracking reference signal is a bit in the future, we do know what we will want to have here. And then the idea is to, to start with that, and instead of solving it forward, we, we take we start with what we want to have, and then solve the dynamics backwards to sort of get the, the trajectory that the target trajectory that we will want the system to to be. And then we at this we, we do know what the boundary condition up here has to be. Um, and then we just set the, the control input equal equal to the boundary value of we um, of the of the target trajectory. So, so to summarize it again, um, it's a bit better described here. So um, we first take the state at the current time step, and then predict what we cannot control, and we we will need this prediction. Um, to, to solve those target uh, dynamics backwards in, in the third step. So we predict what we cannot control. We think about what we want to have here, solve the dynamics backwards to know what the trajectory has to be to achieve what we want here. And then yeah, well, set the control input equal to, to the boundary value here, um, which it needs to be to achieve what we want to have here. Okay, um, so to simplify things, we, we will first look at the simplest case, which are semi-linear systems, um, where the speeds are independent of the state, and this is actually quite a big deal for existence of solution and so on. Um, so there's no state W here in the lambdas, and well, as I said, the big deal is that the characteristic lines independent of the state and therefore also of independent of the input. So when we design this control input, we don't have to worry about uh, what the characteristic lines do at all. And we also know them a priori. Um, so there are different kinds of solutions um, for those kinds of systems. And the, the one that is sort of handiest for what we want to do are so-called prod solutions, which are not the classical solutions of these PDEs. But instead, one transforms these PDEs into a set of integral equations. And then one can show with basically the same fashion as what's done for all the existence of solution of, an, of ordinary differential equations. One can show that this set of integral equations has uh, a global solution under relatively mild assumptions in L infinity. Uh, so L infinity is the weakest sp state space that we can choose. And the big advantage is that uh, for L infinity solutions, we all only need the, the initial conditions and also the, the control inputs to be L infinity functions. So uh, no regularity, they, they can be discontinuous. We can basically do whatever we want as long as it's not infinite. And then when we look at these, at, at the dynamics along the characteristic lines, so we said, we don't want to control the state at the current time, but we want to control the state on the on this characteristic line. So we first define them like this. So, so phi of x is just the time it takes the control input to get from x equals one to some location x in the interior of the domain. So integral one over the speed. And then we, we define this state on this characteristic line as the state a little bit into the future so so this delay into the future and well everybody who's been working on hyperbolic pds knows that this dynamics along the characteristic line simplify to odes so this is the characteristic line of v so v bar satisfies this ode in x so there are no time dynamics anymore um and the rest so the uh equations uh, governing u bar, the boundary conditions, they, they basically have the same structure. So, so u t, 
bar, U bar T has the same stripes as UT, just with slightly different coefficients. This boundary condition here is same structure, just with this time shift. Should be a zero here. Um, so same structure, just time shifted. And then the boundary condition of V bar is still the control input. But so in the original PDEs, there was a direction of propagation. So therefore the control, uh, the, the boundary conditions needed to be specified at the inflow boundary. But this is an ODE in X with no direction of propagation. So we can solve it in either direction. We can either solve it forwards or backwards. And, and like, as we discussed, the, we do know what we want to have here. Um, so let's introduce this new input U star, which is what we want to have here. And then instead of starting with U and solving it for the, the OD for B bar forward, we start with what we want to have here with U star and solve it backwards. And this gives us the boundary value that uh, V bar shall satisfy at one if it's equal to U star here. And, and this is just the, the control input that we need. Um, so, so we now have all the uh, all what you need to, to to implement those four steps. We predict the dynamics, this determinant set, the green set here, based on the currently measured um, time. We design our U star, and since we are in L infinity, we, we can just set it to any value. So we can set it just to the reference signal at the corresponding time, a little bit into the future. Then we solve those dynamics from pre previous slides. So these dynamics here over the next, um, over the sampling period. So from TK to TK plus one, which the x equals zero is, is time shifted again. Um, we have, every, so, so there's a well post system with this input here. Um, so we can solve it. We know what the target trajectory on this yellow domain is, and then set the control inputs equal to, to, to the boundary uh, value of this, of this uh, target trajectory. And if we set you this way, then um, we, will satisfy, um, we will be equal to this value. So exactly what we want. Okay, um, so, so, so here we, we talked about tracking, um, but it's really straightforward to look at stabilizations problems in case origin is an equilibrium and we want to, so this can be an unstable equilibrium and we, we want to stabilize the system there. Um, and we actually want to get the system to the origin minimum time. Um, and it turns out that if we just set u star to zero, so we, we cannot affect the boundary value up to that time, but once the, the control input has, has a time to, to get through the domain, then this boundary value will be equal to u star, so to equal to zero. And, and because of this, g, g u, so the boundary value for, for u will also be zero. And then the whole solution will be zero on this screen domain. So, um, once this characteristic line went through the domain again, and the whole state will be at zero. Okay, um, so much on semi-linear systems, not due to quasi-linear systems. And as I said, uh, um, when these speeds here depend on the state, it, it changes a lot of things. Um, but f first of all, each in the, the characteristic lines depend on the state and on the control input. and if we change the control input too fast or, or just in the wrong way, then the, oops, um, so this can happen. So if a control, control input entering at subtime, going through the domain, then we have a control input entering a later time, but propagating through the domain with a higher speed. And this can, come to the point where, where these two characteristic lines co collide. And even if the solution, so the state itself remains bounded, um, the gradient will become uh, unbounded here and the solution ceases to exist. So, uh, and, and this is not just a purely mathematical problem. So 
if you think of the water channel, like the, the water level will never escape in finite time. But if you change the inflow too quickly, then you can actually happen that the wave speed is higher in the upstream part and then flows into the low stream part where the velocity is slower. So it's only if the inflow is increased fast, very fast, but, but it can happen. And then you get a so-called hydraulic jump uh, where you get a discontinuity of water level and so on, which is probably not desirable because it can cause erosion and it's probably much worse even in, in, in closed pipes. So, so, so it is it's something that even in practice you, you have to keep in mind. Um, so it's important that the controller not only steers the state to this desired state, um, but it also needs to, to prevent uh, the co to these collisions of characteristic lines from happening. Um, similar to before, we can again define broad solutions, but not over well, infinity this time, but so the, the minimum regularity that we need is Lipschitz continuity of the solution. Um, and then one also needs to worry not only about the state, but the time derivatives and the time derivatives satisfy those integral equations, which are quadratic in the state, uh, which again illustrates that, that, that this can happen. So even if the solution remains bounded, um, an integral equation that is quadratic in the state can still escape in finite time. Okay. Um, so one needs to worry a lot more about existence of the solution. In the mathematical literature, there's this concept of semi-global solution, where one can pick a finite time t, and then derive conditions, basically that the initial condition and control inputs change slowly enough, then the solution will exist up to that time. But after that time, we, we don't know what will happen. And Again, in this observer uh, controllability literature, they, they are fine with that. They, they, they take this T large enough so that they can control the system to the origin. And then once they are there, they are trivially at the zero solution, so it will exist. But if there's any uncertainty and we don't reach the origin exactly, then um, who knows what happens after time T. Um, so we want to find a way to, to ensure existence of the solution on infinite time horizons. And again, this, this new input U star at the boundary at x equals zero simplifies things a lot. So if we look at, at it at a SAPDE with inputs U star and then TU at x equals zero and then solve it in the positive direction, x direction, then we do have a finite in, um, interval, which is just a, the spatial, oops, uh, spatial interval zero one. And then this um, whole concept of semi global solution is enough for what we want. So, if again the initial condition, the time derivative of the initial condition is small enough, and the time derivative of this new input u star is small enough, then the, um, the, the solution cannot, uh, the, neither the solution nor the, nor the time derivatives can blow up before they reach the end of the domain at x equals one. Okay, um, with these things in mind, we, we can now do the same steps for control design. We predict the dynamics, take the, take the current state, predict the dynamics and determine its set. It's a bit more complicated because the set depends on the solution, so we don't know it a, a priori. Uh, so we just simulate it for a while and then maybe not, it wasn't long enough, so the characteristic line doesn't go through the whole domain, so we have to make it longer. Um, but, but there are iterative ways to, to figure out um, what is the solution on this domain and what the domain itself is. So we got a solution on this domain. Um, we then designed U star, and it's not quite as simple as in the same linear case. We can't just set it to the uh, reference trajectory because we have to change it slowly and because it has to be at least Lipschitz continuous. So let's say our prediction up to up to that point, so with the period here is black line. We want it to be at a blue reference trajectory, so we have to change it slowly until it reaches the reference and then stays there. And then maybe if there's a step change in the reference, we, we can't just follow it again, slowly have to follow it. 
um, then in the flip step, but, but, but there are ways, and, and one can do this a lot more, but there are ways to, to design this U star so that one um, follows the reference and can show an existence of solution and so on. So we have the U star, then we can solve those dynamics backwards. And again, because we had to change the state base to Lipschitz continuous, we do have to worry about the evolution of the time derivatives. So everything does get a lot messier, but it still has a lot of structure. So it's now a um, PDE with some different coefficients here, which have lots of arguments in here um, for the time derivative of U bar and some boundary condition. Um, so, so the initial condition for U is, is what we get from the prediction step on the first, if, from the first step um, from prediction of the solution on, to, on this line actually. Then both V bar and the time derivative of V bar satisfy ODEs in X, which are again messy but doable. And both cases the, the, the boundary conditions are, are specified here in the bottom, solve it basically in the upwards direction or backwards in time. And then set the control input equal to the boundary value of the trajectory that we want to achieve over that sampling interval. And then we get the solution will uh, have this kind of trajectory at v, v of zero. So the one we wanted. Um, I will not really go into this because of time, but similar, so, so this here was state feedback. So we assume we knew the state here. We can do output feedback where we know only this boundary measurement. And then similar to that we control the state on this line, we now estimate the state on the characteristic line along which the measurement evolved. Um, the dynamics look like this. It's messy, but again, exactly the same structure on the previous slide as on the previous slide as the roles of U and V are uh, switched. And we know all the, the, the boundary um, measurements and, and the, what we put in here in, in terms of the, of the control input. So we are able to, to estimate the state on this line in, within finite time. And then we can sort of predict the current state from this past estimate of the past state by, by just solving the dynamics forwards over, over this domain here. Yeah. And then there's a uh, different so alternative, but, but actually it's equivalent um, way to, to get exactly the same um, state estimate from the same set of uh, measurements, uh, again, by Tatsi and Lee. Um, so, so I guess this, this, uh, it, it's not clear this. So, so from a theoretical point, if there's no uncertainty, they are equivalent, but my expect, expectation will be that, that the numerics will depend on which method you use. So, so it might be that one of the two is somehow superior to the other numerically, but I'm just still not me too. Okay, um, so just to show some simulations of the, the examples that are introduced in the beginning, um, this offshore trailing example. Um, um, so in these figures, the, the time axis is on this direction and this is a spatial domain with the bottom of the well at x set equals zero and top at uh, 3,000, so it's three kilometer deep well. Um, and in open loop or without control, just a constant opening of this, of this valve on the rig, um, get pressure oscillations like this. So significant amplitude at the bottom of the well and then the pressure amplitude decays towards the top of the well and then some small oscillation on the top. Um, this is what the controller does. Um, so, and, and this is, if we assume that we are able to predict the disturbance, so that the wave motion a couple of seconds into the future. So, so when we do those predictions here, when we solve those dynamics, they, they do depend on the disturbance on this domain. So they do depend on the disturbance a little bit into the future. 
So if you assume we have these disturbances available five seconds or so into the future, then the controller applies these kind of pressure oscillations at the, at the top, and they perfectly, except for some numerical errors, um, cancel the pressure oscillations at the bottom. And then when you look at practice, then, well, the C waves, they are a bit stochastic, so most of the time one can predict them, but every once in a while there's a wave which catches one off guard a bit. And then the profile will probably look like this. So it's still a lot better than without control, but like not perfect anymore. Um, another issue is that, so in this case was that if we control the pressure oscillation at the bottom, then well, let's say 500 or 1000 meters above the bottom, um, we actually do create, so with those pressure waves that we sent down in the well, we actually create um, pressure waves that might or might not be worse than what we got uh, without control. And in, in practice, so I talked about tracking the pressure at the bottom, but it's actually more like a section, like the lower 1000 or so meters of the well that where, where the pressure oscillations need to be rejected as, as well as possible. So, so with a slight modification, we, we can do pressure tracking a little bit away from the bottom so that 1000 meters uh, above the bottom of the well, we get almost, we cancel the pressure oscillation, but then they get worse at the well bottom. So this is a bit of a fundamental limitation. So it is a fundamental limitation of this, just of the fact that we have only one control input and there's a PDE between uh, where we want pressure tracking and, and where the actuator is. And there's no way around it. So it's impossible to reject the pressure oscillations over a whole section. Um, the only thing that one could do is, for instance, um, re minimize the, the integral of the pressure amplitude over a sector, but, but it's possible to satisfy only one tracking objective. Um, so we, we also looked at um, sensitivity with respect to uncertainty, and it turned out that even with a bit of, with a moderate amount of uncertainty, um, the method was still better than most of the, um, than the alternatives that were available. So, so, so the blue line here shows and the, the remaining pressure amplitudes, so with the uncertain uh, wave pre uh, prediction, so not a perfect wave prediction, and then a multiplicative uncertainty in the friction factor and uh, the bulk modulus, which models the, the compressibility of the fluid. And so without uncertainty, we, we are a lot better than, for instance, keeping the pressure at this choke constant. And then with a bit of uncertainty, um, performance got worse, but the, the, the perform so the pressure oscillation in, in the other strategies got, got worse too if the um, friction factor increased. So, except if we crossly overestimated the friction factor, we, we actually did a lot better, so still significantly better than, than the alternatives that were available at the time, and similar for the bot models. Um, so we did better, but it unfortunately was still not good enough. So Equinor basically abandoned this approach you know, of using top-sided situation only um, because there was still not, in, in, in most relevant cases, the performance would still not have been um, uh, good enough to, to trust it, to, to apply this technology. Um, and there were also other uncertainties like they didn't believe that they could change the pressure at this choke at the top up here um, quickly enough to, to get the performance that one would need here. So yeah, they didn't want to risk it, but it was still a valuable input to them that, well, these are the, some fundamental limitations and well, we won't get friction right by 10%. There will be some error. Um, so it was good for them to know that well, they shouldn't invest too much and try something else. <laughs> um, to those water channels, so this is a bit of a preliminary simulation. Uh, first of all, because it does state feedback only, whereas here it was output feedback only, like the controller had available where those top side pressures and flow rates. Um, 
this here shows the trajectory of the water level at different locations. So at the bottom of the uh, channel, uh, at the downstream end of the channel and upstream in the shallow part over time. This is the same, these are snapshots of the water level plotted over the, the um, spatial X direction, so upstream end and downstream end. Um, so it's, a, it's probably not the most realistic um, scenario, but it still shows uh, what can be done. So, so in this case, the, the gate at the bottom here is constantly set at one meter. And there's a reference for the water level at the downstream end of 1.15 meters. Um, the channel starts from empty, so it's black dashed line here. It's a bit hard to see. Is the is the bottom of the channel, and then um, fills up from stream until um, it fills up. Um, reaches this water level, the reference water level, and then at 90 minutes we we switch on and additional outtake, which is located here. So for instance, a farmer takes out water at a flow rate of uh, at rate of five megaliters per day for 90 minutes. Um, we do see a little error in the downstream water level, little deviation from the reference, but it's really minimal. And yeah, when it switches off again, a little error, but pretty much the, the controller succeeds in tracking this reference. We also see here that in the upstream parts, so, so these lines here are the trajectories in this part here, different locations. We see that as the, the flow rate through the channel increases, we, we see this increase in the water level. So, so the water builds up a little bit to provide the, the, the additional flow. Um, so, so again, as I said, it's a bit of a preliminary simulation, but it does show that um, principle, it, it, it does work. Um, won't go for this, but um, if the system is linear, then one can simplify the controller to, to avoid those predictions. So, um, to, and, and write it instead in this form as the integral. So the control input is integral of zero to one, some gain, distributed gain times u plus another gain times v integrated over x. Um, So, so, so there's a way to, to make those predictions explicit. So again, somewhat similar to, to explicit model predictive control, but one can avoid those optimizations and predictions and do it explicitly. Um, here one can pre-compute some linear gains um, to, to, to make this, these predictions right in this explicit form. And turns out that those gains are exactly the same as the one that one gets from the backstabbing method, either for stabilization or for tracking. Okay, um, so to finish up, um, some comments. So, so I, all the time I get asked about how hard it is to implement because you have to solve those PDEs, and those prediction steps and backwards, but, but it's really just about as hard as simulating the open loop simulation. So this step here is exactly the same as the open loop simulation. This one is the transformed system, which it's a bit different, but, but it's not harder than simulating it at first, but, which doesn't mean that it's easy. For instance, in this uh, water channel, with nearly zero uh, water levels. It, it is quite challenging numerically, but, but even in this case, even the open loop simulation is also challenging. So it doesn't get really harder. And the computation time is, like most of the time is really a fraction, like a 10 or so second on, on, in a somewhat naive implementation on, on a standard laptop. So I'm sure we can get out a bit more performance, bit, bit out, bit better performance. And it, it, it's not like it would take minutes or so. Um, we do have a somewhat preliminary robustness result, which showed that this bit of error in the parameters and measurement and so on, then one gets prediction here a bit wrong, then one gets a bit, the U star here a bit different to what one would have in the perfect case, one gets the control inputs a bit different, but still um, the boundary value of V at X equals zero stays within a band of what one would get um, in the uh, in the perfect case if one knew everything. So, so the uncertainties are small enough. One, one doesn't one stays close to what one wants, and one cannot. One one also gets 
one can still ensure uh, existence of the solution and you know pre um, avoid this collision characteristic lines. And, and uh, finally, there, there are a couple of extensions. There are a lot more extensions for backstepping method, and we're sort of catching up with this predictive method. Uh, if control inputs are on both sides, if there's in this case more than one control input, or if there's one PDE and then a coupling condition and another PDE. Um, so, so, so the characteristic lines change, but but really all the ideas and control design steps, it, um, they are basically the same. Well, it always comes back to this kind of figure <laughs> where one has to figure out um, like what the characteristic lines are in the determinant sets and so on. Okay, thanks for your attention. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tim. So if anyone has a question. Okay, since we don't have any questions for now, please send your questions to Tim later through his email if you think about it, because it requires a bit of digesting probably. Uh, thanks a lot, Tim, again, and see you, yeah, see you everyone next week. Okay, thanks.